So welcome everyone to our uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, and uh, as in some of the last sessions we had, we again have a joint seminar between the uh, Digenomics uh, Lunchtime Seminar Series, uh, the Bremen AI Data Launch Series. And again, this is a joint uh, endeavor with the Data Science Center of the University uh, of Bremen. And um, just a brief notes about the three uh, institutions uh, or organizations. Uh, the research group uh, Digenomics is an initiative of the Faculty of Business Administration and Economics at the University of Bremen and examines issues uh, related to digitalization of labor markets, uh, financial markets and product markets. And uh, it deals with the economic, ethical and societal work related and political issues uh, related to new digital markets. Bremen AI is uh, the official cluster of, for artificial intelligence uh, in Bremen. And uh, the aim of Bremen AI is to bring together people who work in and around uh, the field of AI. And uh, again, we have uh, Sven here and others and Lena from uh, Bremen AI, um, who will also answer questions if you have some, some related to that. Uh, and the Data Science Center of the University of Bremen had just this opening uh, event uh, recently, a couple of days ago, and uh, brings together uh, scientists from all area or research areas uh, with the aim of strengthening data science across all disciplines in research and teaching. Today, we are very proud and happy to have uh, Markus Pelger here. Uh, Markus received his uh, PhD in economics, uh, which is always good, uh, from the University of uh, California at Berkeley. He's a scholar at the uh, German National Merit Foundation, the Studienstiftung des Deutschen Volkes, and he was awarded a Fulbright Scholarship, uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking Prize, uh, the Elliot Swan Prize, the Graduate Teaching Award from Stanford, and uh, recently also the Utah Winter Finance Conference Best Paper Award, uh, best paper award, uh, best paper and asset pricing award at the uh, SFS. And um, he has actually two diplomas, uh, one in mathematics and one in economics. Um, and uh, he received both with uh, the highest distinction from the University of Bonn in Germany. Uh, then Marcus actually moved to the US, so uh, where he received his PhD, and currently he moved across the bay uh, from, from Berkeley to Stanford, uh, where he's now an assistant professor of management science and engineering at Stanford University. He's also the uh, Raid and Polly Anderson faculty fellow there. Uh, his research mostly focuses on understanding um, and uh, managing financial risk, and in his re research, he uh, mostly develops mathematical financial models and statistical models, analyzes uh, financial data and uh, engineers computational techniques. Uh, his research is divided into three uh, big three, uh, three big th uh, streams. Uh, one is stochastics and financial modeling, uh, higher frequency statistics and statistical learning in high dimensional uh, financial data sets. His most recent work includes developing machine learning solutions to big data problems uh, and uh, empirical risk management uh, and asset pricing. Marcus' work has appeared in the Journal of Finance, uh, the Review of Financial Studies, uh, the Journal of Applied Probability, and the Journal of Econometrics. Uh, he is an associate editor at Management Science and uh, also referees for several journals in the field of statistics, economics, finance, and management. I recently asked him whether he would like to join uh, the editorial board of our new uh, book series and advanced studies in the genomics. And uh, I think, as I understood it, he is happy to join, which uh, made us very proud. Today, he will give a talk about uh, deep learning in asset pricing, uh, which already won uh, several best paper awards of, uh, at prestigious conferences. And we are very happy to have you here, Marcus, and we are very much looking forward to your talk. So the floor is yours. Lars, thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction and the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So let me share my screen first. All right, I hope everyone can see this. So this paper is joint work with my PhD students Luyang Chen and Jason Zhu, both from Stanford University. Um, my understanding is that this is a very broad uh, seminar here that means we have participants that can be from industry, 
as well as from other fields. So I just want to make sure that um, the big picture is set up here. And the bigger picture question is how to use machine learning in finance. And one application in finance that practitioners care about a lot is making investment decisions and risk management. So why is machine learning promising to use it for this problem for investment? Well, machine learning techniques are good in extracting signals from large information sets because of some form of regularization. They are built to capture complex nonlinear relationships among many variables. And because of a smart regularization, they typically work well out of sample and are robust to overfitting. Now, an important point is that most machine learning methods are used in the context of prediction. But a model that is good for prediction is, for example, not a good model to create portfolios that are optimal for investment. If you look at the literature that tries to bring these machine learning techniques into finance and investment, typically they split the problem into two parts. So there's a prediction problem, for example, predicting future returns. And that can be done in simple frameworks, linear regression models, or it can use at the other end of the spectrum quite complex models like deep learning models. Given these extracted signals, portfolios are designed like buy stocks that have a high predicted return, sell stocks that have a low predicted return. And then that is used to evaluate the benefit of machine learning. Now, one main point I want to stress here today is that it matters how you set up the objective function. And in particular, if you care about optimal portfolio design, you want to extract the signals that are optimal for the portfolio construction. And those are in general, not the same as the signals for prediction. Now, again, to make sure that we're on the same page, <laughs> I want to point out some notation and some words I'm going to use today. Um, so in practitioners, as I mentioned before, when it comes to investments, they care about creating portfolios that are, have a desirable risk return trade-off. Um, I will look at the problem from an asset pricing perspective. Uh, in the end, it's the same problem, um, but just two different perspectives on this. I will talk about the stochastic discount factor, SDF. Um, if you mainly care about the investment perspective, think about this as a portfolio that has an optimal risk return trade-off in terms of Sharpe ratio. I will talk about test assets. You can just think about this as investment strategies that I want to explain with a model, with an asset pricing model that explains mean returns by exposure to some sort of risk. And the part I can't explain will be the pricing errors. And so the goal of my presentation today is to show how to construct optimal portfolios and optimal asset pricing models. And that is relevant um, from my perspective, from the academic perspective, because I want to understand what are the sources of risk and what explains the risk premium in markets and um, why do certain assets have higher average returns than other assets. If you mainly look at this from a practitioner perspective, um, what you can get out of this is uh, portfolio constructions that have an attractive risk return trade-off. Also implicit in an asset pricing model is a prediction element. So it allows you to identify over or underpriced assets. It allows you to predict what the average return should be. And that can be used for risk management. Now, let me now start with the actual talk. And this talk is about asset pricing. And the fundamental question asset pricing is to understand why do we observe different prices for different assets. We know the answer to this question is exposure to risk as measured by a stochastic discount factor or SDF. So assets should have higher expected returns because they have a higher exposure to this SDF. The big question is now what should be this SDF, right? And this SDF completely characterizes our asset pricing models. Now the, there are, this question is challenging for a number of reasons. So first of all, the SDF, and that means my asset pricing model should depend on all available information. That means I have a large number of variables. Second, there's no reason to believe that this functional dependency is simple, like linear. So it can be complex, can be non-parametric. 
third, dynamics should matter. And what I mean by that is that in times of booms or recessions, exposure to risk, the compensation for risk can be different. So we need to take into account dynamics. Now, these first three elements um, might be addressed with machine learning methods. And when I talk about machine learning, I mean uh, methods that have some form of regularization to deal with large number of variables and are flexible in the functional form that they can fit. So they're non-parametric. Um, now, the issue that we have with financial data, in particular now with uh, stock return data that I will focus on, is the low signal to noise ratio. If you want to predict stock returns, um, depending on the data set and um, the setup, there is less than 1% of the variation that can be predicted. The other 99% is a non-predictable part. And what we want to explain in asset pricing is exactly this predictable part, that's the risk premium part. So there's a very little signal in this data and that makes it hard to extract the signal. Now, what this paper is about, it will discipline a machine learning algorithm by including economic structure, more specifically, no, and no arbitrage objective function. And I will show that this strongly improves the signal of what we can learn from the data. Now, before I go into the model set, I would just want to highlight three of the important challenges that we deal with in asset pricing. I want to point out how we are going to solve those. So as I said, the first question is, what is the asset pricing model? Or more specifically, what is the SDF? What is this functional form? And what information should it depend on? So the very popular models that we use in finance are linear factor models. So one uh, widely used model is the Pharma French five factor model. This model assumes that the SDF is a linear combination of these five factors. And the information set that um, this SDF depends on will be based on um, size, value, investment and profitability information of stocks, because these are the characteristics that are used to construct these Pharma French five factors. Now, the problem with using these kind of models is that, number one, the linear form is most likely misspecified. And previous research has shown that there are hundreds of characteristics that seem to have some information about expected returns. Now, the solution that we bring to the table is that we will be able to say what should be the functional form, and we can also make a variable selection to end up with a model that tells us what is actually relevant to explain uh, this SDF. Now, the second important question, which unfortunately has not received the attention it should in the literature, is about test assets. So test assets are important in asset pricing because we need them to evaluate models to say if a model is good or bad. And we also need it to calibrate our asset pricing models. Um, very popular test assets are the double sorted portfolios of Pharma and French. So there are 25 portfolios sorted on size and book to market ratio, which are commonly used. Now, if I have an asset pricing model that can explain these 25 portfolios, it does not mean that it can explain other test assets like industry portfolios or momentum sorted portfolios, etc. cetera. Um, so the problem is that if you only select or evaluate models on a small number of test assets, you do not know if it's going to work more generally. So what we argue in this paper is that we should use all stocks and any possible portfolio that we can form based on these stocks as the test assets. And we are going to do this in a data-driven way. The third point is about the states of the economy. Um, and this is coming back to this issue of dynamics. So as I mentioned before, we would expect the exposure to risk and the price of risk to be different during times of booms or recessions. And a simple way to take this into account is to include, for example, NBR recession indicators, and maybe also interaction with other variables. Now, this is obviously a very coarse way to take this information into account because we have hundreds of macroeconomic time series with complex dynamics. So what we are going to show here in this paper is how to take a large dimensional panel of macroeconomic time series and to extract a small number of economic states out of those 
that are the most relevant when it comes to explaining the return of assets. So this paper is about estimating the stochastic discount factor. And as the title suggests, we're going to use deep neural networks to do this. And the crucial innovation of this paper is to use a no arbitrage condition as part of the neural network algorithm. And that is going to discipline this machine learning technique and help us to find more structure. Now, we are actually not using one, but three different networks. And each of these networks is going to solve one of the challenges that I've pointed out before. There will be one neural network that maps the SDF into my information set. There will be a second neural network that extracts the state of the economy from a large set of macroeconomic time series. There will be a third neural network that generates the most informative test assets that I need to calibrate my asset pricing model on. And these three neural networks are glued together by a no arbitrage objective function. Now, one thing I want to point out is that this is a very general model that essentially includes all existing models as a special case. So we can learn what are the features that we should include in a good model and what is less relevant. Now, I just want to highlight the takeaways from this paper. So empirically, it works really well. And otherwise, I would not present it here today. Um, and when I mean it works well, so all the results will be out of sample results. And I will focus on a number of key metrics. So the sharp ratio, that means expected excess return divided by the standard deviation um, of the SDF um, can be, is a measure of how much um, asset pricing information we capture in the data. So theory suggests that if you have a good asset pricing model, the implied SDF should have the highest possible sharp ratio. So out of sample, our SDF portfolio has an annual sharp ratio of 2.6. And that's, that holds for around 20 years out of, 25 years out of sample. Um, and that is much better than all the other benchmark models that we consider. At the same time, we can explain 8% of the variation in individual stock returns, which is twice as large as the other benchmark models we have in our paper. And if we look at more conventional test assets, these are um, portfolios sorted on uh, characteristics. For all these standard tests as if we get cross-sectional R squares that are higher than 90%. Now, we do not only get good numbers, but we can also learn about the economic structure of the SDF. Surprisingly, um, if you look at firm characteristics in isolation, they have an almost linear effect on the SDF. However, there are non-linearities that come in when we um, look at interaction effects between characteristics. To give you a simple example, small stocks are just different from small value stocks. Um, and that's exactly what we capture here. It matters to take into account the state of the economy. So we need to extract this macroeconomic information. But then the SDF structure that we fit is surprisingly stable over time. So we only use the first 25 years to estimate our model and the next 25 years will be complete out of sample and we get these good results. We can also make statements about which variables or which kind of characteristics are the most relevant to capture pricing information. And if there's one takeaway of today's talk, then it should be that if you simply take off the shelf machine learning methods, they're not going to perform very well. However, you know, even a linear model that is optimized for the problem that we want to solve can outperform a fully flexible model that is not looking at the right objective function. However, if you combine the flexibility of machine learning with the economic model structure that you have, then you can get very powerful models. Um, so just to give you an overview of the literature, and this is an incomplete literature review, I just want to highlight different directions that have been taken. Um, so most flexible machine learning techniques use, um, look at the prediction problem. So in particular in the context of finance and 
um, one um, um, pioneering paper in this literature was a machine learning forecasting paper by Gu, Kelly, and Chu. And what has been done in this literature is to do this kitchen sink approach, predict next period's returns using a large information set. Now, this literature has shown that nonlinearities matter and flexible functional forms are relevant, but I will argue that they are not are not able to capture all relevant information because they need to put more structure on the problem. That's what we are doing with this no arbitrage constraint. There's another strand of the literature that also looks at large information sets and imposes some economic structure to find, for example, a small number of factors. Um, and this literature has shown that it matters to include this kind of economic constraints or penalties. Um, now you can think about what we are doing here as combining this insight that um, some economic structure should be used, but we combine it with the flexibility of the machine learning methods. Um, I also want to highlight one paper that I've been working on with uh, Svetlana and Jason that goes back to the idea of test assets. And we show how to use decision trees to get interpretable test assets that are informative, um, while interpretability in these more flexible deep learning models uh, can be more challenging. Um, I will come now to the model, but I just want to let you know if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to interrupt me anytime. So the problem that we are looking at is a fundamental no arbitrage moment equation. And I will look at excess returns. It means returns uh, minus the risk-free rate for asset I at time t plus one. If I multiply by the stochastic discount factor, which I denote by M, then this should have a conditional expected value of zero. Now this is a standard asset pricing moment equation that you find in any graduate textbook. So one thing that's important is that we have a conditional expected value here. That means that's denoted by this little t here. What this means is that any um, information that I observe at time t or any random variable that, I, that only depends on time t, I can put it into this uh, expected value and form an unconditional expected value. So when we talk about no arbitrage, what we mean is just um, a collection, an infinite number of moment equations that defines no arbitrage. So what we want to estimate is the stochastic discount factor and um, this M and without a lot of generality, we can project it on the return space. So what we really want to get is a portfolio of all traded stocks that I will call it my SDF portfolio. Um, and the weights that we put on all the stocks will be general function of my information set. Now, once I've estimated this SDF portfolio, I have two things. So the SDF portfolio is a very attractive investment opportunity because it should have the highest conditional sharp ratio in the economy. Um, on the other hand, it also gives me an asset pricing model. Now, my weights, these portfolio weights are functions of my information set and I will split my information set into macroeconomic information that could be unemployment rates, inflation rates, GDP growth, et cetera, and firm specific characteristics that have an additional sub index I, and that could be the size of a company, the book to market ratio, past returns, et cetera, right? So the problem is to estimate a function of this information set. And this can be a flexible function that depends on many variables and that is where deep neural networks can come in. Now, just note that this no arbitrage conditional moment equation is equivalent to a factor representation. So I could equally well write this as excess returns of any asset equals um, exposure to an SDF factor. This exposure is measured by a beta and some component that is not that has no risk premium that should have a mean of zero, I will call it the residual. Now, this SDF beta is also time varying because it's a general function of the information set. 
So what we want to do is we want to estimate the SDF weights, which gives us an SDF portfolio, which allows us to estimate the SDF beta. And once we have this, we can um, decompose the return of any asset into its predicted part, which should have a risk premium and a residual, and then we can do standard asset pricing. So how are we going to do the estimation? So let's assume I have chosen a conditioning set. So what do I mean by conditioning set? Conditioning set is just any kind of function of the variables that are observed at time t. Remember, then I get an unconditional moment. So let's say I've chosen a function g, which gives me a conditioning set. Then I can take my unconditional moments and um, do a, a, a GMM, general method of moment estimation. So here I just look at the sample moments that I would have. And I can, I want to find an SDF that gets these sample moments as close as possible to zero. And so what we do in this paper is we use a deep uh, feed forward neural network. So it's the simplest neural network you can work with to estimate these SDF weights. That means M that minimizes deviations from um, 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 that the moments are equal to zero. Now, this point is important, so please pay attention. If you multiply excess returns with some conditioning function based on your information set, you're essentially, you're essentially forming managed portfolios. Let me give you an example. If my conditioning function G is one, if um, the characteristics of a company um, correspond to small stocks, or it's zero if the company is large, then this product here forms characteristic managed portfolios, namely, I would try to get an asset pricing model that explains small cap stocks. Similarly, different choice of indicator functions here could create size and value double sorted test assets, right? So choosing a conditioning function in a GMM problem is equivalent to choosing test assets for an asset pricing equation. In econometrics, we call this problem finding instruments. Um, now, the one thing I want to highlight is that the deviation of this moment equation is actually a pricing error. So chosen, given a set of test assets, how much I deviate from zero here corresponds directly to a pricing error that my asset pricing model has. Now, the problem is that we have an infinite number of candidate moment equations. Any function I can come up with for this large information set I could choose here. So the question is, what should we use here? And the solution will be our generative adversarial network approach. It works as follows. So let's say I've chosen some conditioning sets. It means I've chosen some test assets. Then I'm going to estimate an SDF that minimizes the pricing error for these test assets. But now I'm going to play a zero sum game with a second neural network, a conditional or adversarial network. Given an SDF, my adversarial network is trying to construct test assets. That means trying to estimate a function G that creates the largest pricing errors. That means it's trying to generate the test assets that I cannot explain well with my current asset pricing model. And now these two networks are going to play a game with, at each other and this process will be iterated. Let me give you an example. So let's assume that we choose the Pharma French five factor model as our M, as our asset pricing model. We know that Pharma and French have essentially given up on pricing momentum portfolios. So my adversarial network might propose mom momentum sorted test assets. Now my asset pricing model might add a momentum factor to M to explain those as well. And this is the kind of process we are going to use. It's essentially the same process that we have used in academia for the last 40 years implicitly. You come up with a new anomaly, you add a new factor to your asset pricing model if necessary. So what we are doing here is finding the states of the economy 
and the test assets are, that are the most relevant for asset pricing. Now, the problem of choosing optimal instruments in a GMM estimation is of course not new. I mean, um, in the standard framework, um, the choice of instruments is based on efficiency. One example, one paper that's doing this is Nagel and Singleton, which is a paper um, that uses GMM to choose optimal test assets. Now, I just want to highlight a couple of points here. So number one, we have an infinite number of parameters because we estimate a non-parametric function for SDF. And that is where standard GMM is going to break down. So we, have, um, we don't even necessarily have standard normal distributions or estimators, et cetera. The second point is more subtle, but it's really important that has to do with identification. So all papers in this GMM literature that talk about efficiency and the nagel Singleton paper does the same. They assume we, have a, we know the test assets that identify all the parameters of our asset pricing model. And now we just need to select those test assets that gives us the most efficient estimator of our parameters. In the real world, we do not know which test assets we need to use to uh, capture all parameters of interest. So that is where this min-max um, formulation comes in. It will ensure that we conserve all relevant test assets. So our notion is based on robustness. And I argue that's the right framework if you have a large set of instruments and parameters, and if we are not sure um, what information we need to identify all parameters. So are we done yet? Well, not yet. We still need to deal with the dynamics. So we have hundreds of macroeconomic time series that we could use, but there's one issue that we have to deal with when it comes to macroeconomic time series most of those time series are not um, stationary. Let me give you an example. If we take the S&P 500 price, we obviously have a non-stationary time series for the price. So what do we do? We take differences in some form. I mean, for price data, it's very obvious. We take log differences, which gives us a return. Now, if you look at um, most papers in this literature, they take macroeconomic information, they do the standard transformation, which is some form of difference. And then they just feed in the last observed difference or the last observed increment into some kind of learning algorithm. Now, the important point is, if you just take the last period log return of the market or the S&P 500, you cannot infer from that if you're in a boom or recession. The only way to make statements about dynamics if you include all lacked returns. So you need to take a much larger information set and that's usually not done. So um, there is, you could argue, well, okay, then why don't we just include some lacked values, some lacked returns into our problem, then we are done. Now, if you have hundreds of time series and you include all their lacked values, you have too many variables, even with some form of regularization, and you would ignore that time has a specific structure here. So what we are going to propose is to use LSTMs. These are long short-term memory cell networks to extract a small number of economic states. I think all of you have used LSTMs before, even if you're not aware of this. So Apple Siri, Android's speech recognition, Amazon's Alexa, they all use LSTM. So LSTMs are used for speech and text data. And that is just a very specific form of time series. And we argue it's actually perfectly suited for our problem here. So what is this LSTM going to do? So we take a large dimensional panel of macroeconomic time series. And the LSTM will do two types of dimension reduction. It will take a extract a small number of macroeconomic factors. So it reduces the cross-sectional dimension, where it takes advantage that most macroeconomic time series are dependent. And second, it extracts from those macroeconomic factors, the dynamics. Um, so what I will argue later is that what we detect are um, 
deviations of a short-term mean from a long-term mean, and that will be roughly our states, which is in line of how we think about business cycles, for example. Um, there is a long and short term uh, in the name of LSTM and direct, that refers to the attention element of LSTM estimation that allows you to detect dependencies that are very far in the past. And that is very important when we talk about business cycles because the kind of dependency patterns we think about are spread out over time. All right, now let me describe what is our estimation approach. So we take this macroeconomic time series, we extract from those a small number of economic states, we combine those with firm specific characteristics to estimate an SDF that prices well um, a set of test assets. Now we have a conditional or adversarial network. This is going to construct its own economic states. It combines them with firm characteristics to construct test assets that we cannot explain very well with our candidate asset pricing model. Now this process is iterated until convergence and that's what we call our GAN or generative adversarial network. So let me come to the empirics now, unless there are any questions. Um, and we will also have time after the talk for questions that you might have. So the data that we use is fairly standard. So we use 50 years of monthly stock returns. We use essentially all stocks in the US that uh, are on CRISP. There are certain selections that we need to do because of missing data, but we take, use as many stocks as possible. So it will be around 10,000. We have 46 firm specific characteristics. Those are the usual suspects. <clears throat> that means size, value, momentum, investment profitability, et cetera. Those are normalized to cross-sectional quantiles. So you have the ranking that each uh, stock has with respect to some characteristic in each month. We have 178 macroeconomic variables. So we have the 124 that have been used in previous studies. Um, these are the freight macroeconomic variables. Um, in addition, we take those from Goyal and Welsh that are not included in the FRED data set. And for all our firm specific characteristics, we also have the median time series. So it's a very rich information set. Then we use the first 20 years of our data to estimate our asset pricing model. The number of tuning parameters or hyperparameters that we select in the next five years. Then the next 25 years, we evaluate our model, that's pure out of sample. Now our asset pricing model is time varying because it's a function of time varying variables, but the function that we estimate is fixed. Now, what are the benchmark models? So what happens if we take our framework, but we restrict all the functions to be linear? For example, the SDF weights have to be a linear function of um, the information set. Now, our information set, we normalize this to um, be quantile ranks um, and they're centered at zero. So you will see if you <clears throat> use this linear model, then essentially you can reformulate your problem as mean variance optimization on characteristic managed long short factors. So the whole problem becomes um, a very standard mean variance estimation problem. And it means the parameter that defines um, your SDF weights is just the weights in a mean variance um, portfolio based on these long short factors. Um, we will use this as one benchmark model. We call it LS. Because we have so many characteristics, um, we know that um, estimation of mean variance type or mean variance type of estimation will have issues. Um, so we also include a form of regularization, more specifically an elastic net regularization. And so what we get is an SDF estimate in the same spirit as Kozak, Nagel, and Santosh's um, robust SDF um, estimator. That will be EN, and these will be our linear benchmark models. The second benchmark is 
if we go all out on the machine learning front, so a fully flexible model, but we do not include an economic objective. So this will be a forecasting model, and we take the best performing model of the Goo Kelling shoe paper, which is also a feed forward neural network. We use this to predict next period returns given um, the information set that we have at time t. Now note, in a no arbitrage model, the prediction, which is just a conditional mean return, is proportional to an SDF beta. So if I do prediction, I essentially estimate an SDF beta. Once I have an SDF beta, I can recover actually my SDF. So if I do prediction, I also get an asset pricing model. So what we will do is, for these different models, we will get the SDF portfolio, we will get the risk loadings, the SDF betas, then at each point in time, we can run a cross-sectional regression with our time-varying SDF betas that gives us a residual, right? So we run this regression on all stock returns at each point in time. And then we can do asset price. We can evaluate um, um, how well our model is doing. So more specifically, we are going to report the Sharpe ratio of our SDF portfolios. We will um, square the residuals and average them over time and cross-section this gives us explained variation. And we first average the residuals over time, which gives us an alpha and pricing error. And then we average, we square these pricing errors and average them over the cross section. That gives us a cross section R squared. These are just the standard asset pricing metrics that we use in, or generalizations of the standard asset pricing metrics. Let me come to the main results now. So this table shows the results on individual stock returns. So please only focus on the test. That means the out of sample results. Our model is gone and we have a monthly out of sample Sharpe ratio of 0 0.75 that corresponds to this annual Sharpe ratio of 2.6. That is almost twice as large as the other models. FFN is a simple feed forward forecast as a forecasting model. And the other models are the linear special cases. If we look at the amount of explained variation, our, we explain 8% versus only 4% for the other models. While in terms of explaining mean returns, we are around 30% higher than the other models. Now, what is interesting is that a linear model, so essentially a linear factor model, but that uses a no arbitrage objective function with regularization performs better in terms of these metrics than the naive kitchen sink forecasting that uses neural networks. Then again, it comes back to the statement that it matters that you include economic structure. So what information is important? I mean, I understand that the model that we propose uh, is not, it's complex, it has several parts and we want to understand what really matters for asset pricing. Now here I just focus on the Sharpe ratio, expected excess return divided by standard deviation of the SDF. And um, I look at different um, model formulations and um, here is a sharp ratio on the out of sample test data. That's what you should focus on. Our benchmark model that I present on the last slide is this GAN hidden state. That's the top line. And I ask the question so, what happens if I feed in the macroeconomic time series exactly the same way how all the other papers in this literature do? Just last period's increments. These are the yellow bars here the models are completely going to collapse because last period's increments of macroeconomic time series are more or less uninformative. They're essentially noise. If you feed in hundreds of irrelevant variables, even with some form of regularization, we have overfitting because in sample, so you can see very clear overfitting of these models, but out of sample, their performance is going to collapse. You will do better if you completely leave all macroeconomic information out. So we're going to refit all models here using only firm specific characteristics. You can see there's a difference between our optimal GAN without macro 
and with microeconomic information, and the difference is around 10% out of sample. And that quantifies what is the importance of including macroeconomic space, the 10% gain. But what is the other extreme where I say I extract the economic states, but I do not form this test asset with an adversarial approach. Instead, I just try to explain all stock returns without using um, these portfolios. So essentially I take as my function G an identity function. So I'm just trying to explain the unconditional mean of all stocks. That will be, you can see the unconditional model as another benchmark in the red bar. That is a 20% lower Sharpe ratio out of sample compared to our GAN. And so that tells you that choosing informative test assets is the most important step in our model. Then the second important step is to deal with the dynamics. Now note, our model also helps us with prediction. The SDF beta should be proportional to the conditional mean. It means a high SDF beta should correspond to higher conditional means and a lower SDF beta to lower conditional means. So what we do here is we will um, sort all stocks into 10 deciles based on the SDF beta at time t. And then we look at the return at time t plus one of these 10 portfolios. And what you can see is we get a perfect prediction in the sense that high SDF betas will have higher future returns, low SDF betas will have lower future returns and the order is perfect. Now the out of sample data starts here. So this is in 1989, I guess. So this is the part that you should pay attention to. Um, so our model predicts future returns, but the paper is called asset pricing. So we want to go back to asset pricing results. And now we are going to look at the more standard test assets, which are portfolios based on individual stocks where we do some kind of sorting. For example, we take um, um, a short-term reversal, which is based on last period returns and sort all stocks into 10 decile portfolios. These are value-weighted portfolios based on high or low uh, short-term reversal. So based on the different quantiles. And what I want to show here is that the explained variation for these 10 test assets with our GAN is almost twice as high compared to the other models, while the cross-sectional R squared is over 90%, while the other models are much worse. Right? So this is just an example how much we do better on standard test assets, but this was not cherry picking. This holds for all kind of characteristic managed portfolios that we could generate. We have 46 characteristics. So in total, we uh, will create 460 value-weighted decile portfolios, 10 for each characteristic. And I will try to explain each of these 10 portfolios with our models. And here's a summary of results where I show you the mean return for these uh, 460 portfolios and the mean return implied by our one factor model. And if, if things were on a 45 degree line, we would have a perfect model. Our GAN model is not perfect, but it gets the monotonicity results right. In contrast, um, if you look at simple forecasting or the linear models, uh, it's more of a cloud. You see very clear mispricing. It means portfolio returns where the expected and the predicted returns are much out of line. Now, now we have an SDF. Um, we know it works well, but we want to understand what is it. Now, the simple, now get, uh, each SDF that we have is a time series. So now we can look at correlation type measures of this time series. Um, for example, given that our SDF is an investable portfolio, we can see if it can be explained by standard factor models. Um, we try to explain it with a pharma French five factor model. It is not spanned. Um, the most significant part in this time series regression will be the intercept, which is a time series alpha. Um, and uh, bottom line, standard factor models will not span our SDF. But so what does our SDF depend on now? Well, we have a lot of variables. We want to see what are the important variables. 
if I run a linear regression and I've normalized my explanatory variables, I can look at the slope coefficients of my linear regression to assess which variable is more or less important. Um, now, what we are going to do in this nonlinear model, we are going to look at the average absolute gradients in the SDF weight of all our variables. So it's just a generalization of this idea of slope coefficients. We have grouped all our characteristics into six groups, trading frictions, value, intangible, profitability, investment, and past returns. And what you can see is that um, the variables that are the most important among the first 20 are among all these different categories. So this is the reason why most factor models that are popular in the literature have factors that are in these different categories, because it seems like you need to include this type of information. This is not the case if you do a simple forecasting approach, right? The kitchen sink prediction approach, if it, the first 14 variables that it's deemed, that it um, um, classifies as important are all based on trading friction and past returns. And those are the variables that are um, quite dominant when it comes to small illiquid penny stocks. So if you do simple forecasting, we argue in the paper, you might just overfit illiquid penny stocks, which means this is not really a structure you're after in the end. Well, our model seems to capture the more relevant structure for asset pricing. Now we could also ask what are the relevant test assets? This is this function G that I've talked about, this conditioning function. Um, I can look at what variables are important for constructing this G. We get the same kind of message as with the SDF weights. All different categories are important. If you look at the top 20 variables, all categories are represented. So at a minimum, we can say if you only construct test assets based on size and book to market ratio, you are missing out a lot of information. What about the state of the economy? Uh, our model suggested there should be four state uh, economic states. Um, and we have plotted them here. And the gray shaded areas are NBR recession periods. If you look at the third and fourth economic state that we plot, you can see that this one always seems to spike downwards right after a recession. Well, the first one seems to spike upwards always right after recession. So our economic states that we extract with the LSTM seem to be related to economic activity um, and seem to be just more complex versions of dynamic uh, business cycles. So last but not least, what is a functional form? Now, our SDF rates are a function of many variables. So what I'm going to do now is I will fix all variables at their median value except for one. Now this gives me a one dimensional function and that's something I can plot. Here I show you the, how S, the SDF depends on size and value given that all other var variables are at their median value. And this looks close to linear function form. Actually in the paper we show that almost all characteristics look like linear functions if you, um, plot them um, um, in a one-dimensional sense. But what happens if I look at interaction effects? So if I look at the effect of size on the SDF, if the book to market ratio is either um, in a lower quantile, that means I look at growth stocks, or if the book to market ratio is high, that means I look at value stocks. Then you see there are non-linear effects coming in. So um, val value stocks, um, are more nonlinear than growth stocks I mean, in terms of how they depend on size. Similar, if I look at the effect of value among large cap stocks, that would be the purple line versus small cap stocks, you see it's different. Um, and so these nonlinear effects that you see are interaction effects. Just to clarify, there are a number of papers that assume an additive structure, even a nonlinear, but additive structure for characteristics effect uh, returns. In those papers, these lines would need to be parallel shifts here. So even if the linear model, all these lines need to be linear, 
if I rule out interactions, then different lines here should be parallel shifts of the same function. What we see here is an evidence for that there are interaction effects. And I can illustrate this more by looking directly at the complete two-dimensional function relationship of how size and book to market ratio get into the SDF. This two-dimensional function has the same monotonic patterns we have seen before, but there are complex interaction effects going on here. And we think this kind of nonlinear patterns are what matters, um, that, that, that distinguishes our model from the linear models. We can look at the three-dimensional function relationship. Bottom line is it's complex. So two more points, and then I'm going to wrap up. So one is about robustness. So we have tons of robustness tests in the paper. We have a very long online appendix where we report a lot of different formulations. So one thing is our results are robust to market capitalization. Um, that means our results hold qualitatively if we only look at large cap stocks, but we show that other models are more prone to overfitting. Um, so in some way, our adversarial approach actually protects us against this overfitting of small cap stocks. We show that our results do not depend on tuning parameters. In fact, um, it matters less how you exactly select your neural networks. For example, two or three or four layers, that's not the point. What matters more is how you set up the objective function of the, of the problem. So all the top performing models on the validation data set give us the same results on the out of sample data, but it's not only the same numbers, we show that the functional forms and variable importance rankings are all more or less the same. So we get the same model with all tuning parameters. And we also show there's stability over time. We also fit our model on a rolling window. So instead of one estimation, we fit it several times. We show that our results are fairly robust to this. So it's not the choice of time windows that we have chosen here. Um, and there's only a very minor gain if you re-estimate your model so we think the structure that we fit is actually fairly stable over time. One last point um, that um, is more about bigger picture, um, and it comes back to the introduction I had at the beginning about um, what does this mean, for example, for practitioners uh, in the finance industry. Um, there have been some discussion recently about um, well, machine learning is great, but um, once you want to do it, use it in the real world, trading frictions will eat up all the paper, all the profits that you would see on paper. Um, now, what we show here, just to give you some intuition, we estimate our optimal portfolios, our SDF portfolios, and we can use a very coarse way to cut out stocks that might be more prone to market trading frictions. For example, I use, um, uh, we know that smaller stocks um, have more trading friction, so I can just exclude all stocks that are below a certain quantile. I just set their weight to zero in my SDF weights. Um, so for example, I exclude the 30% of smaller stocks uh, given the estimated SDF function. And you see that the out of sample sharp ratio is going down if you exclude um, some of those more um, stocks with more frictions, which holds for all models, that is correct. But it also indicates that there's a trade-off. Um, and I just want to highlight again, papers that do a naive prediction, which is first of all, not optimal to extract signals for portfolio formation, then you use those signals to form a portfolio and then make arguments, oh, the portfolios are not good in the real world they might just not have extracted the right signals. If you care about extracting signals for portfolio formation, you need to have a portfolio formation or asset pricing objective um, for extracting the signals. If you care about extracting signals to form portfolios that are profitable with trading frictions, your objective function should be that. So you should select the signals that trade off uh, the frictions and the portfolio objective. One step into this direction is my work with Svetlana and Jason, 
where we use decision trees to form optimal portfolios under constraints. So let me wrap up here now. So this paper was about using neural networks for asset pricing. What was new here is that we started with an economic method of moment problem inspired by this no arbitrage condition for the estimation. So it was not a prediction problem. Um, different neural networks took care of different problems. So there was an issue of time variation and we captured time variation with time very macroeconomic and from specific characteristics that vary over time. And you, we use an LSTM to get economic states. We have the problem of choosing test assets and we use an adversarial approach to address this. And so we come up with a very general asset price model that performs really well out of sample. We make some statements about non-linearities and it seems there's a reason why linear asset pricing models are so popular and successful because in isolation, if you only look at one characteristic, asset pricing is close to linear. However, there are interaction effects that make the problem non-linear. And we think that is the reason why we perform better than linear models. Then we make statements about what matters. Uh, macroeconomic conditions matter, for example, our model can predict future returns. Um, we get a quite stable structure over time. And from a pure investment perspective, we get a very attractive investment opportunity. The paper has more results. So we show how our framework is complementary to, for example, conditional multi-factor models and how you can use this adversarial uh, objective function to also estimate um, as surprising models if you have a prior on what the factor should be that should span your SDF. I'm going to stop here now. Um, and I want to thank you for paying attention and um, I look forward to your questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Markus, for this uh, excellent talk uh, and uh, presenting this excellent paper, which will have implications, I guess, for so many strange, uh, strands of uh, asset pricing literature. And uh, I open now the floor uh, to everyone. I stop the presentation.